You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So here we are, Word in Your Ear, actually together in your attic in West London. This is quite exciting. Literally my attic. This is the first time we've actually done one of these things where we two, both of us have been in the same physical space for years, isn't it? It's absolutely weird. In fact, this is weirder, really, than doing it the other no, way. No, it is. Because it is. we got so used to doing it the other way, which we started doing at the beginning of, well, COVID, wasn't it, really? Because that was when, the week when COVID descended, was I was supposed to have a meeting that week in person, and then somebody said, no, it can't happen. It's going to have to happen via a thing called Zoom. And we'd never heard of Zoom. I said, I I said what is that? Pray tell. And they told me. And now it's absolutely a second nature to us. So here we are. We're up on in Mark's attic. Frankly, I'm, I'm looking at all the neighbours' improvements, all the little, <laughs> all the little terraces, the little extensions, and, and uh, oh, yeah. the, you know, houses in West London. They just keep getting built up further and further up in the air, don't they? Which possibly, of course, could have been harbouring an escaped criminal yesterday because it was international news. We had people from all over the world. Saying, getting in touch and saying, my God, the, 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 the terrorist who broke out of Wandsworth is now apparently in Chiswick. Is he now a terrorist? I don't know. Oh, was yeah. the I, know uh, I, know, I have no yeah, idea yeah, at all. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but you, were, you, were, you were definitely excited. And I think I detected when the man was eventually detained in, in North Holt, you were frankly a bit miffed. I, was, I felt robbed, <laughs> literally robbed. We'd had so much excitement. Police helicopters overhead. And a, a slightly sniffy article of The Guardian this morning going out about people were mowing their lawns and, uh, you know, really rather annoyed that this jailbird was on the loose and they were, and it was uh, compromising their lifestyles. Yeah, anyway. But anyway. So that's uh, further excitement in what's been an exciting week, uh, starting with a group called the Rolling Stones putting out their first record since what? Since uh, that, that blues 18 record. 18 years ago, wasn't it? Well, no, they, but that was the first one of original material. Yeah, right. the, the blues bomb was about 12 years ago, I think. Uh, I know. And, and, and the way these things start for me nowadays is always the same. I get contacted by some, frankly, nine-year-old researcher from a TV or a radio station who has been commanded from on high... Uh, by somebody who said, uh, you know, we need to do something about this Stones album. Get David Hepworth. They probably want Mark Ellen, really, but anyway. (laughs) Get David Hepworth. Mark Ellen's busy. So the nine-year-old researcher, you know, has to to follow up this this call. And they're, they're weak in two areas. One is they obviously don't know who the hell I am, not that I'm anybody, you know. And two is they don't really know who the Rolling Stones no. are, you know. So the two kind of central components. Well, the, this brings to mind for me the death of Clarence Clements and getting an email from somebody saying, "Will I go on whatever radio program it was?" And they spelled it, 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 the, the tag was just Clarence Clements. They spelled Clarence wrong, and they spelled Clements wrong. <laughs> and I thought this is absolutely unbelievable. Was it somebody purporting to be really upset by? The, oh yeah, the yeah, passing? yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's so thing that, we're all mortified. Yes, by the, absolutely. Yeah. By the, by by the, the death by of consults check, notes. Checks I know. Notes. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So then this person, I said, yeah, I'll do this. And uh, so then this person said, I just need to get a few uh, responses so that I can write the intro, you know. And uh, and this person said, so were you, were you surprised or excited by the news? And I'd the say, idea that you, David Hepworth, you know, <laughs> in your dotage, was waking up every morning for the last one every two years. Can this be the day the Stones surely. surprise launch a new album? I check the stocking on the end of my bed yeah. every morning, <laughs> thinking, yes, surely, <laughs> they've got to do Please, it. Just for me. Yeah. And uh, I had to say, look, I've been, I've been kind of listening to the Rolling Stones and kind of aware of the Rolling Stones since I was 12 years old, yeah, yeah. round about the age you are now now you know so the notion that i've i mean anyway surprised or excited it's just a fact of life i'm kind of i'm kind of interested you know yeah. what i mean it's it's like you know it's like i keep on telling you that, that i'm obsessed with anthony powell's dance to the music of time where the same characters keep 
recurring after about 10 year That's absence. It. You know, it. Well, life nowadays is like that, isn't it? You know what I mean? You haven't thought about the Rolling Stones for 15 years and then suddenly, suddenly they're there. Here they turn up. And of course, nowadays, we all saw the press conference. Uh, with Jimmy Fallon at the Hackney Empire. Hackney Empire. Hackney Empire. And uh, which I was inescapably reminded of the fact that you and I used to fantasise about the idea of doing a series of The Last of the Summer Wine featuring the Rolling Stones. I think Mick, there, Keith no, and Ron just they're absolutely there. perfect. They are amazing. Shuffling around home but, for the, pushing I, each I other up down hills. But do you remember, wheels. we always used to talk about this, remember that the headline, usually in the Daily Mail, every time, this was in the 1980s, whenever they, uh, whenever they toured, headline used to be, combined age oh, 235 no. years. Well, the headline last Thursday was the same. It was combined age 235 years. Now, obviously, divided by three rather than divided by five. But I do think that's ridiculous <laughs> because there used to be only one story about the Rolling Stones, which is that they're, they're, they're old, they're too old, they're wretched, and they should stop. And now the story is they're old, they're brilliant, <laughs> and they should keep going for as long as possible. <laughs> absolutely. Which is absolutely extraordinary, don't you think? And all the people interviewed that I, I caught in the news media were all kind of people in their 40s who yeah, yeah. gone along to the press conference. Because he was just excited to be in the room. With the Rolling Stones. All I could say was how cool they were. Keith's just so cool. <laughs> that was their only analysis. I'm not really sure he is. No, really. I don't think he's that cool. And, and the only real story is, really, that Mick Jagger is 80 years old and still kind of looks like he does, which is, in the distance, looks fantastic. I mean, yeah. close up, not so good. I mean, the concept... I remember McCartney saying this when asked why he dyed his hair. He said, because in the distance, with a Nero jacket on and the Hofner bass and the dark hair, I kind of looked like, at a festival, I looked like Paul McCartney. <laughs> but uh, but I just say, whereas if I didn't have dark hair, I wouldn't. And Mick Jagger obviously thinks the same thing. But close up, my lord, he is quite wrinkly. <laughs> But the point is that he's so physically fit. That's Absolutely. the story. My God, an 80-year-old, look at him. How amazing. God, he works at it, doesn't he? I know. And he, he felt me in the press conference to be a lot more on the ball than, uh, than Ronnie and Keith. Far more on the ball. Um... Uh, Keith, had, uh, Keith had very little to say, actually, apart from be even more, uh, in an even more cartoon-like way, to be Keith, just sort of go, oh, bless his heart. <laughs> Never <laughs> joked about anybody. <laughs> I know. And, and to kind of tangle with Mick Mix in one of our songs, he's like a gospel song. He, they really laid on the accents, didn't they? So like a gospel song, he said, you never been to church in your life, or something. <laughs> just to kind of stir it up and be difficult, you know. Yeah. Now, the curious business of this record is called, what was it called? Hackney Diamonds. Now, that was really good. I didn't know that. Did you know that one? Do you know what no, Hackney no, Diamonds were? Hackney Diamonds are apparently the br- bits of broken glass that you find on the streets in Hackney. It's an old Cockney expression. After there's been a burglary. Oh, right. So he said, I'll tell you what, that's a nice looking house. There'll be a few Hackney Diamonds oh. outside of that on Monday night. You know what I mean? I've never heard that. One. I know, it's great. A broken windscreen or whatever it's known as Hackney Diamonds. Oh, I was really, see. I know. I thought great. it was there attempting to associate themselves with the kind of, you know, gritty part of London. Whereas Hackney. Well, it's got it's got a very posh part. It's, <laughs> well, it's like anywhere in London. But now, my God Almighty, absolutely. So, parts of London you associate with the Rolling Stones. Go, uh, Dartford. Dartford, which is obviously where I'm making key. Richmond, from. Uh, Richmond, Eel, Eel which, Pie Island, which is obviously where the sod. Eel Pie Island, Twick, Soho. and then Soho. What about Chelsea. what about Chelsea Wharf? Where they, I think the first ever photo session was down there with a with a derelict house in the back. Well, they were all Chelsea, obviously, because they lived in uh, in what's it Road, didn't they? Uh, just off the Cambridge yeah. Road, Edith, Edith Grove, uh, which they subsequently, when they did their ex- exhibition, didn't they? The, yeah, um, they reconstructed. The, the fetid old kitchen. That's it. That, you know, which is a, still an extraordinary idea that anybody bothered to recreate 60s sleaze, you know, for the benefit of anybody who wouldn't understand it. I know, you, know? you can't imagine there's a pint of milk that had just been left there for three months or whatever. But they're not, they don't, I don't associate them with North London. No, I, really. I, don't, I, I never, I never see them in Is- Islington or you know, Muswell Hill or anywhere like that. Whereas, they also, I think about their early songs. Do you remember Play With Fire? Yeah. Brilliant song. It's on the B side of, what was it, on the last time, I think it was. Really good acoustic. I, they used to write these fantastically bitchy songs that they never put on A-sides. And uh, Play With Fire was about, you know, um, 
you know, a girl who was uh, who was slightly too posh. She didn't know what she was doing. And uh, mm. and I think one of the verses goes, a mother is an heiress, owns a block in St. John's Wood. And a father would be there too if he only could. Now she gets her kicks in step. That's right. Not in Knightsbridge not anymore. Not in Knightsbridge anymore. <laughs> yes. I always love those kind of references, you know. But anyway, so I thought it was intriguing the amount of ink, as you might say, that the Rolling Stones, you know, after 60 years. It's incredible. Still got. And I couldn't help contrast that. That very evening, so it was almost a little afterthought I saw in social media, that the Mercury Music Prize was being handed out that very evening. And I thought... This has not got even one percent of the publicity. No, the, 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 where, the, where it was actually the Rolling Stones conference, which I watched the whole thing. I think it was about half an hour long. There was very, very little material. Nothing at all. there. I mean, partly because I don't know what I think about this, but because there is really no answer. But Jimmy Fallon chairing it. I mean, I know it's an international thing, and you need somebody who's reasonably well known. But it ended up. I don't know if you saw the whole thing. But it ended I up with them. Jimmy Fallon doing impersonations no, of the Rolling thing. Stones that's and that's his thing and telling their stories for them so yeah. as Keith uh, sort of that kind of accent you know he was telling some hilarious story about falling off a ladder or was, you know and uh, you think this is incredible he's actually he literally taken tells over. a story there's a lot of truth I, 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 and the other thing that was really extraordinary was the bit where he got the questions from the audience do you follow that bit oh no go on got the questions from the audience and I scribbled a couple down he said one of them is Lou asks it doesn't say Lou what country Lou's in or says Lou asks um, do you have an all-time favourite Stones song oh, oh my god can where is that say? how can that possibly generate a, a new story that will travel question. all over the world and do you know what their answer was they didn't have one really. get away <laughs> yeah they did so that was an absolute non-starter the next question was uh, one for Ronnie um, you played with Van Morrison last night how come you play with other bands I'm thinking again this is they must have. There must have been hundreds of questions to choose from. These are the questions they chose. There was one quite good question, which was, "Why do you play darts?" And I thought, "Well, that's interesting. Maybe it'll just prompt some kind of smash hits type kind of uh, mm-hmm. elliptical response," which it didn't. But I mean, I, I mean, obviously, if you were put in that position, it'd be very hard to find the kind of question that that might that might generate. Well, something I think explosive. it is quite an interesting question. This. Because it, it, it does have kind of journalistic kind of dimensions to it. That very often you will put questions to people that if they were put to you, you'd be completely nonplussed. Yeah. Particularly in the moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? In I'm front of the three audience of you, because you're very compromised by there being three of you. Well, who's it two? And the, only were- thing, the only thing that you can ever seek to elicit is an answer that they've already got prepared. Yeah. It's like... Listen, you've done it yourself. Yeah. You know, people ask Tee you up that. the little clip people, we want people to ask you that you know they ask you this at literature festivals or whatever. Who's the worst rock star you've ever interviewed? Oh, whatever. Yeah, you've got it all ready to roll. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> you, you tell your little one, Van Morrison or yeah. whatever. Yeah, I yeah. tell about Bob Dylan. I tell it a million times, you know. But if I didn't tell that one, I'd really have to think like yeah, crazy. Really. Well, it's kind of like the same thing yeah. with rock stars, yeah. you know, asking. Trying to get snappy responses, it's a, it's a fool's a fool hardy you know um, pursuit. I would have thought. But also, it's the, a it's the stones, and b it's it's the stones in a, at a time when when good news is perilously thin on the ground. And the idea of just seeing these old boys together is enough for every news. Channel, well, you see, that's it? the thing. We we oh look, we were happy then. Man, Do you remember the Rolling Stones, nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies? You oh, see, they ought to just have just put a locked off camera on the three of them, on the stage, don't ask them any questions. Just watch them, just looking at look each at other. That. That's, at that's all the entertainment anybody wants, know. you know. And I love the way the world's so forgiving about them because they showed the video of the song, Angry, which is actually quite good. I it's think. all right. I think the, t- the chord sequence of the, the chord oh, is really good. I'm oh, sorry. Chord, chord sequence. <laughs> I thought it was lovely. But anyway, it's brilliant. They've got the girl from uh, White Lotus, haven't they? Right, yeah. Uh, and she's basically sprawling about uh, in a bikini on the on the back of a car <laughs> going through Los Angeles, writhing around, you know. Everything about that is the kind of unreconstructed Welling Stones. Yeah, not one ghost of complaint from anybody. It's the Stones. They yeah, kind of yeah, utterly forgiven, yeah, yeah. Which is great. Yeah. It's funny. And, of course, also, they were doing that press conference in order to announce a record that you can't buy for ages. 
Because it's all about getting the pre-sale, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's all about get your orders in now. Yeah. So that when it comes out, it'll go to number one on Amazon for about 10 minutes. And they can get loads and loads of publicity out. That stone's back, 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 yeah, you know, yeah. for however long it lasts. But uh, anyway, so the contrast between that, I couldn't help thinking, and the Mercury Music Prize, I thought, oh, my God. You know, there's another worthy list of kind of things that nobody's going to listen to. But I was pleasantly surprised. I'm going to go further. I was delighted to wake up the following morning and find that Ezra Collective... Who are really good, aren't they? Who I've been playing... (laughs) I don't do much. People say... People always say to me, are you listening to any new music? I go blank. I completely go, go blank. I ought to just well, say no, for the last Ezra Collective. two years I you should have, be saying Ezra Collective. I, look how brilliant that I, would look now. I, look, I told you. Yeah. Well, it's only about for about six months I've been listening to that record ever since it came out. And I do think it's really, a really good record. And more, more to the point, it is a record that you reach for. You know, because you very often think, and like a morning like this, you know, we're looking over the rooftops of yeah, London, yeah, yeah. and it, and it's sunny, and you think if you want to listen to something, you just put on the Ezra Collective record, and it kind of suits. It's up, you know. It has it has a mood. It's it's very instantly accessible. And I was, <laughs> but part of the part of the issue is that they describe it as jazz, didn't they? So it was really well. Really, a- the group call themselves a yeah. jazz group well, so, and I was kind of thinking well they're not really they're, you know they're kind of Afro beat aren't they they're high life the calypso well, you, see, and they're you can't and they're use all those things weather report I know of course not and so I feel sorry for everyone because you've got to categorise with people but normally if you say they're a jazz group what they're saying is if you don't like jazz you won't like yeah, don't come near which is yeah. not true not case. absolutely it could not, not be less true because if I play they do any of my, my pals they, just they wouldn't make you think that's jazz they just think that's, that's a good. dance band that's, that's a really good instrumental dance yeah, band yeah. it's fantastic absolutely and you know Radio 4 was saying it's one for the first time ever by a jazz group of course they always have a jazz record on the list, don't they? Yeah. Like they always used to have a folk, well, they probably still have a folky record. And the folk and record. With, 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 with rare exceptions, I don't think they ever win, no. do they? And, uh, but if ever that you're going to pick something, and it's certainly a jazzy record, there's no doubt about yeah. that. Um, you know, so if you like jazz, you might like it, but it goes a lot further than that in its appeal. And of course, it makes you think about. The um, this whole business that jazz, you know, from the nineteen twenties to the well, go back earlier than that, the early days of kind of Storyville and so forth, and uh, you know, twenties and thirties and the forties, jazz was dance music. That's what it was. Yeah. What, why would you have jazz? You weren't going to sit down and listen to it. You were going to dance to it, and of course. Come the fifties, that old change, particularly of, instrumental jazz music, you know, which yeah, is what they are. Yeah, yeah. and uh, whereas this is a kind of reconnection of jazz with its kind of dance roots, it isn't is. it? So weirdly, it, felt, it sounds quite old fashioned sometimes, although there it isn't remotely, but it just sounds, doesn't it? Just that old fifties kind of get up and get up and move. You know? It's, it, I think, it's a terrific record. It, it fades a bit near the end, but that's all. All records made too long. But I tell you the other thing I like about it. I haven't actually got a physical copy. I must get a physical copy. I've listened to it loads of times on streaming. But have you seen the cover? Because the cover kind of reminds me of the cover of the basement tapes. You remember when they put that out in the mid seventies? And there must be other albums. What, with, with, with all the gang? In it's there. got the whole group. Yeah, in a, in a room. In a, and it could be any kind of room, a domestic environment. Somebody playing the piano, the drums are there, the horns are there, and so forth. And they just, it just looks, it, 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 um, it accomplishes what I think every album cover should seek to accomplish, which is to communicate a sense of warmth and a sense of, come in, you know what I mean? People having fun here. Yeah. You might And you're this. invited. You're invited. Yeah, yeah. And so few album covers have that kind of thing, you know. And in fact, I, they mostly have the reverse, which is... I, I'm having a really miserable time. Can, please uh, go yeah, away. Please leave me alone. Please don't bother And me. let me kind of weep in this corner. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> this is just warm and infectious in, in every... And that applies to, to the sound and also applies to the kind of 
the packaging of the, of the whole thing. And it reminded me about, and you must be able to think of examples of this, how when you were a teenager or whatever, your favourite albums, you would just spend hours just looking at the cover, just looking at the pictures in the background, or, oh, look, he's got a so-and-so, or, oh, look at his shoes, you know, all the tiny little bits of detail. And they're so important, those things are, to people. And they Oh, God, well, the White Album is a really good example of that. White Album, you were given so many of them, wouldn't you? Oh, what do you mean? The, the, oh, yeah. The, the stuff that you pulled out. Yeah, I suppose so. But, I mean, if you... I don't know, yeah, well, Sergeant Pepper or whatever. You know, detail on an album cover is a really good thing. It is. Yeah, you because know, it draws you back again and again rather yeah, than something... The band's that, album, just looking at the band, seeing pictures of them recording was the most thrilling thing in the yeah, world. They weren't exciting pictures at all. They weren't doing anything, they weren't posing like that, but they were just so revealing. And yeah. just so wanted to be there. Yeah, yeah. So that's Ezra Collective, our pick to click, except they appear to have clicked already. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. It was our wedding anniversary this week, our 44th wedding anniversary. Uh, and do you know what we did to paint the town, Mark? Um, you probably stayed in and watched an old James Stewart That's film. Pretty, <laughs> no, all right. That's pretty bad. And had a pizza, takeaway pizza. <laughs> it was slightly better than that, but we did stay in indeed. And I watched, uh, I watched The Importance of Being Earnest. Uh, oh, you know, my God. With, uh, Michael Dennison and, uh, and uh, I can't remember, Edith Evans. Yeah, so. fantastic. And I, I just, every time you watch an Oscar Wilde, you always pick up a line that you never picked up before and think, I must use that again. And in this case, it was the, uh, when, <laughs> when he's bracing the piano and he says to his valet, he said, don't you think I sound rather good? He says, I didn't think it was polite to listen, sir. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's so demure. So, fortieth, forty uh, fourth wedding anniversary, and I noted a couple of days later that Cat Stevens tweeted that he and his lady wife were also celebrating their forty fourth wedding anniversary, which I was quite taken. Which, about in this. the world of, of uh, pop and rock, is pretty fantastic, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. But I, so I, I can, I can not think it. I wanted to retrace that week that we got married and find out whether Kat's wedding was in the papers at the time. You know, I wasn't aware that they got married the same week as we did. Anyway, best of luck to them and congratulations We had some, well, we've been married 41 years and in the same year that we got married, I think Bono got married, still married, uh, after 41 years, it was 1982. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne, yeah, oh, married. still married. I think that, that, that is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. They are, yeah, they are. I think they are still Definitely. married. It's incredible. Yeah, uh, Joni Mitchell got married the same year. They're not still married, actually. No. Um, but there are other ones, aren't there? I mean, um, what long-lasting rock and roll Peter marriage? Noon. Peter, Peter Noon. Noon of Herman's Hermits when Six, he was twenty-one years old in nineteen sixty-eight. In nineteen sixty-eight, got married to a girl. I think was younger than him. They're yeah. still married. Yes, they're still married. They're still married. Just had their fifty-fifth wedding anniversary. John Paul Jones, which I think is astonishing. Oh, all that. Let's have, he John lives, Paul Jones lives just over there. He does. He does. Let's give him a wave. Yeah. Um, in nineteen sixty-seven, he got married. Wow. Fifty-six years ago. It is absolutely incredible. It, it is absolutely extraordinary. Oh, it should be just something about even. I mean, Alice Cooper, forty-seven years. Um, uh, you know, Ringo, forty-three. I mean, his second marriage, but second marriage, forty-three. That's pretty impressive. I suppose it is. It I is. suppose it is. And I suppose yeah, you. Can't can't speculate about this thing, but if Linda McCartney lived, you, you kind of think. Oh that God, absolutely! That would still be. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, ab- absolutely, rock solid. Yeah, God. yeah, yeah. Is it? Is it Robert Smith long married? Yes, Robert Smith's another one. Though, he he married those teenage school. What was she? Sweetheart Mary, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, same yeah. thing. It was yeah. the girl he met at school? As did Bonner. Bonner married the girl he met in the class, and when he was fourteen or fifteen, Alison, I think she was called. Well, listen, congratulations to all of them. Incredible, isn't it? It's fantastic. It's really good. What else are we going to talk about? Well, we we ought to mention the Freddie Mercury... uh, (laughs) Freddie Mercury's exquisite clutter, which I now regret I didn't go to because apparently it was... Various mates of mine did go, but the queues were so long. I love the idea of this. Sorry, I interrupted you. I was walking down Bond Street the other day and I saw this vast queue, really long queue, of, of kind of people... Slightly younger than me, not yeah. a lot younger than me. Uh, you know, and I thought, what, what the chickens is this? Is this a sale at, on at Phoenix or something like yeah, that? Yeah. And I thought, oh no, they're queuing to get into. Was it Christie's or Sotheby's? Sotheby's. Sotheby's. Um, 
to have the viewing of uh, uh, Freddie Mercury's exquisite clutter. But what think. exquisite clutter? What? I mean, it's fantastic. Do you know the right? Do you know how many items there are? Well, I know there were 50 kimonos. 50 kimonos. F- you say, I think it's too many. <laughs> well, it made me think, what, if you had unlimited wealth, <laughs> what would you spend, what on would you spend it on? Kimonos. I mean, it's just the, the idea that you have 50 kimonos. I mean, I can also understand the value of certain things. Like that. I can understand the value of buying all of it, really. Um, but, I mean, you know, there was stuff like there was, you, there was a stained glass panel. Of that was something I can understand buying that. And then you bolt it into your house somewhere and you can say, that was once for anybody. I can see that would be quite good. Um, you know, a bonsai plant holder. That's what you've always wanted, Dave. <laughs> he had several. So you got your bonsai plant there. And you said, well, that's what Freddie Mercury used to produce it. I mean, but whereas the white cat suit and ballet shoes, the problem with that is you can't... You can't um, you can't wear it. Can no, because if you wear, I'm, if you I went to a party can. wearing that, it would devalue can. it. <coughs> Whereas the silver bangle that he used in the Bohemian Rhapsody video, which I noticed sold last night for five hundred and fifty thousand pounds, you could wear that. I mean, you could uh-huh. you could wear that as something, that, and you could say, "I know, I know." The, the socks the, isn't there a collection of socks? And uh, I know that the um, the art critic Valdemar Janicek said Sotheby's has proved, this is on Twitter, Sotheby's has proved that the human race really is dumb, gullible, shallow and feeble-minded as suspected by mounting a sale of Frederick Mercury's sock collection and the contents of his wastebasket. In the sale last night, the door to his garden sold for 412,000. I saw the picture of it all covered in graffiti. Covered in graffiti. I am going to send it to Kate Mossman, our old pal from... She's Water probably wrote on it. She, she, her writing will yeah. be on there. <laughs> so she where's, was there. Where's Roger? Was she age 15? Yeah, age 15. She was there hanging around. She's got little photographs of herself hanging around oh, outside no, his house, no. scrawling graffiti with her brother on the gate card. God. It's absolutely brilliant. So where do the proceeds go? Do they go to charity? Or well, the I think they go to, some they go to charity. Some it possibly goes to his pals. Is it Mary Austin? Who was the girl who owned it all? He left it all to her, didn't he? I, I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm sure, yeah, yeah. But I thought it was a really interesting story. And I, I was trying to think if there could be any example of anybody who would have uh, an auction of their stuff that would create the same kind of, have the same kind of impact. But I don't know. You see, McCartney, McCartney has that enormous it's warehouse. Well, yeah. Which you've been to. And yeah, well, I, I went his, 40 um, years ago, so I can't imagine yeah, how much tried, stuff it is now. about... Freddie is that Freddie's all about tax, all about stuff. Yeah, and but so, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's interesting. Nobody would want a McCartney bonsai plant holder. They would. Whereas with Freddie, it's immediately funny. But, it's Freddie. Yeah, but it's born that. You see, it's not. It's not funny. It's not funny anymore. Actually, it's kind of. It's tragic. It's kind of. Um, did I tell you? I was reading this interview of David Furnish, Elton John's husband. You know, and his manager. Yeah, he was talking about. The um, managing the legacy of Elton John, obviously Elton John's still with us, but you know, managing him as a brand, and it's really interesting if you look into all this area. I know our friend Eamon Ford wrote a huge, yeah, yeah, great yeah, book about good this, book. Leaving the Building. You know, all about Rockstar Estate, and what you have to do is to wait for your moment, and what you have to do also is to accentuate the elements of the story that find favour in the present. And so Elton John, you know, rocking man, was very yeah. definitely outsider, gay, yeah. mental health. You know, these are the contemporary buzzwords, aren't they? These yeah. are the things you go on about. You don't talk about, there's loads of other stuff you don't talk about. And it's really interesting. I, I, I bet when, you know, when did Freddie Mercury die in the late 90s, didn't it? You know, if you'd gone to Sotheby's, Back then, said I've got a sk- I've got fifty kimonos at the back of the van here, and, a, and an old garden gate. Are you interested in Freddie Mercury? No, thank you. Not interested at all. Whereas now, time passes, and I noticed the the interview with the with the classic lady from the auction house, who are you know you can only take your hat off to them. <laughs> their their kind of the things they will say in pursuit of in pursuit of revenue. She said, it's, it's fascinating, Freddie. He had one of the largest collections of black and queer artists. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 because Batman, you couldn't say, you couldn't that. say that. You know, it was, 
Whereas, obviously, you look at it 30 years later, you go, oh, tell you what, here's, here's the button you push, black and queer, you know what I mean? It's kind of, uh, he, he was a patron. He wasn't just a guy who was uh, quite a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? Um, that's so what you think there's an element of tragedy about it? So there's tragedy. With, with tragedy, tragedy is what people that, want. Yeah. Tra- tragedy is... Gives, uh, makes tragedy is what people want in a dead hero. Yeah. They want a sense of tragedy. They don't want the sense of that somebody uh, kind of, you know, lived a perfectly <laughs> satisfactory life and, uh, you know, they were, they want to feel that they, they want to stand for something. They were, yeah. They yeah. want to stand for something because otherwise it's just a pair of socks. It's just, <laughs> it's just a bonsai plant holder. <laughs> And uh, but this is one with uh, of enormous import yeah. and represents something bigger. Yeah. I think it's great. I don't think I can't think of a single person who could produce. If Elton John, I mean, you know, I say Paul McCartney, it, 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 there just isn't that kind of. There isn't that kind of, you know, a, amount of stuff and that, that, that sense of desire. Do, don't you think? With Freddie, it's gear you can buy. I looked at the thing this morning of just cats, the lots involved with cats in this auction, and there are just just tons of them. Lots of little China cats. Mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of people would really like to have, and are paying handsomely for it, a little collection of Freddy's. You see, that's the thing you never underestimate. It's like we always used to say, well, Michael Jackson was earning more money than anybody had ever earned in the history of pop music. How is he possibly going to lose all this money? Well, he did. Well, he did. He spent it. Yeah. Because the truth about people like Michael Jackson and Freddie Baker are probably a bit the same. The shoppers. Yeah. They're absolute inveterate shoppers. Elton John certainly did have a shopping problem. You know, he couldn't see a thing without having it. You know what I mean? Whereas it doesn't happen with most of us. I, I, I once went on the road with Rod Stewart, I think it must have been for Q in about 1985-1986, and Rod Stewart just had an hour off and he went to town and bought a load of suits and bought a watch. And the watch, I think, only cost something like twenty three or 24000 pounds But that seemed a lot of money to it, me it in 1986. It was. And he just bought it just to, kind of just to show it to me, really. Just yeah. so that he could go out and buy, yeah. on a whim, £24,000 worth of watch. So can... And something, something obviously important was fulfilled for him. Because every day, to prove that he was Rod Stewart, he had to prove he was able to do that. Yeah, yeah, so it's quite complicated, you know. Yeah, this is not pop music, but have you been following the story about the former Liverpool player John Barnes and the bankruptcy? Yeah. And, and now John Barnes, apparently bankruptcy has happened a number of times with John Barnes because basically he got, he got what was highly played, paid for a footballer back in the day. It wouldn't compare at all nowadays, but it was a lot back in the day. And just basically spent it and didn't keep anything for tax. And so every time the tax man turned up, he, he, he had nothing at all. Because the thing I can't get over is he's currently being paid £200,000 a year by Liverpool Football Club to be a club ambassador. So he is getting more money to not play, to football, not play football than he got to play football back then, you know? And that's just the... But that's the scale of football generally, isn't it? I mean, nothing that happens in the 80s or 90s now seems absolutely preposterous when there are people going out and signing up for Saudi Arabia for, what is it, 190 million? Oh, I... I mean, it's it's suddenly a different league. Yeah, it is. Literally a different league. So, while we're on the subject of sport, the the, the Rugby World Club has started and the major controversy is is the rendition of the national anthems. Have you followed this? Go on. They, um, they have. I missed this bit they've last got, night. They've got. You're very fortunate. They've got them all recorded by a choir, yeah. which I think has been made up of uh, underprivileged children, and so they've recorded vocal arrangements of all the, you know, so everything from the Marseillaise to whatever is the Namib- Namibian yeah. national anthem or whatever has been done by this choir. And it's then played in the in the um, stadium to the bemusement and puzzlement of absolutely everybody. You know, so Friday night opening game, France New Zealand. You've got the you know the the, the stadium, eighty thousand absolutely revved up French people. If ever you've got a choir who want to sing the Marseillaise, there it's there. Not allowed. They play this recording. People try and join in. And after a while, you can almost hear the whole crowd going, what the what fuck? The <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely... 
absolutely ridiculous. And of course, now they've got themselves into a situ- situation, they've been complaints about it, obviously. They've got themselves into a situation where they can't be seen to back down because you're letting down the underprivileged children or whatever, you know. It's as this, uh, this, you know, doomed attempt to introduce some note of nobility into, into major sporting occasions. It just stop doing it, you know what I mean? It's the game and the crowd. It's the game That's and the all crowd. you need. That's all you need. You don't need anybody abseiling from the top of the stadium. You don't need anything further. You don't it's need never virtue enhanced. Singling. No, you absolutely. Not at all. But as you say, they can't go back now because they've now made this deal with all the, all the charities or whatever. That, and, you know. and also with anthems. Anthems don't work if you don't have nationals singing the anthem. It doesn't work. If I sing the Welsh national anthem, yeah, yeah. it's completely... It's got to be the Welshest person you can imagine. <laughs> or ideally a load of Welsh people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I've always said, you know. Shirley Bassey with the Manic Street <laughs> Crutches. <laughs> it should be. I'm the ghost of Deke Leonard. I always used to say the St Jude Rogers, you know. Uh, Jude's brother is a, is a, is a Welsh choir master, at least. And, uh, you know, it's like you want a, a b- bunch of burly Welshmen in blazers, ideally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, Stand, yeah. standing there singing it as if they learnt it when they were four years old oh, and no. it's never gone away oh, you know? no. and the same thing should apply to every anthem you know, from every country but obviously they can't do that with the World Cup they can't realistically have a Namibian choir no. or a, ja- even a Japanese choir probably so that's been their solution and I think whoever, whoever um, came up with the idea ought to be or to be sent into the billiard room with a bottle of whiskey and a load of revolver. Told to do the decent thing. Told to do the decent thing. Because it punctured a, the balloon. That's a disaster. This is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. I just want to add one more thing, which is that, uh, do you remember we're often talking about uh, the skill and diplomacy required when you go and see your mate's band? And they're not very good. And you, you don't want to be dishonest. You don't want to say something you don't mean. But you just want to say something that sounds optimistic but doesn't uh, reveal your actual opinion. And, uh, you know, the, the best example is, you've done it again. <laughs> you know, it's, it's absolutely terrible set. And you don't want to offend them. So you've done it again. And I've just been soliciting uh, a, a few more examples of this. And it's getting quite a good list, OK? Here's another one. What a night. <laughs> <laughs> Only you could put on a show like that. Here's a good one. Well, you look like you were enjoying yourself. <laughs> and I could see what you were trying to do. Oh, God, That's really I good, isn't it? Yeah. it? Obviously, it's great snare sound. It's, uh, so the audience really enjoyed that. It's always a good one. Got to keep myself distant from them. How do you remember all those lyrics or chords or whatever, you know? Well, that was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Here's another good one. I cried all the way through that. <laughs> You're very good at what you do. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it. There were some astonishing moments. And lastly, you took it to a whole new level. Fantastic. I know. So if anyone's got any more um, additions to this terrific list, which I love. The only trouble is if you ever do anything, you and I are actually going to be appearing at a, 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 a book festival today. Yeah. In Chiswick this, uh, this afternoon, you know. And if somebody comes up to me after and said, you've done it again. <laughs> you'd have done it I should be, I should go home with my head in my hands. <laughs> I was thinking about this today, actually. My, uh, my mother, I used to be in loads of plays as a teenager. Did a lot of those at school and so forth. And she would dutifully always come, you know, always come. But I think a lot of the time she didn't really like it or didn't know what it was all about or whatever. And she would always <laughs> say to me afterwards, I could hear every word you said. Oh, that's lovely. Which she, which she always thought was a really... Oh, it's so a worth she skill. was hanging on your every word. No, but it's she also... Was she was aware of the fact that it's not easy to go on a stage and no, have no, people she understand wasn't, well, clear she wasn't leafing through a no. magazine or anything. No, just... But anyway, uh, my wife, um, who's been many times to hear me do things at literature festivals, even though I always say, do you really want to come? You, you surely have heard everything I ever have to say. The last thing I want to do is look down at the audience and see my wife stifling in your book. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell... Afterwards, not from anything she says, I completely can detect it in the tone of what of what she says. You know, her approval. So give me an example of what I she can't wants do to say. It. Just a tone. I can't do it. Maybe it's a lack of eye contact as well. <laughs> <laughs> I 
how it stares at feet. Yeah, really brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You had them rolling in the aisles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. oh God! It's sobering, isn't it? The word podcast. Clearly, there is no plan. At this point, we're joined by one of our valued Patreon supporters. In this case, Matthew North, who has taken the opportunity of his birthday to uh, regale you with his personal theory about popular music. His theory is that the great year is 1984. And he intends to prove it with reference to a number of LPs. Here we go. Obviously, not, next year will be the 40th anniversary of 1984, of which all the record companies, no doubt, are sitting there waiting to release all the deluxe box sets of many, many albums from that year. And, and for me, I think there were so many records released in that year that were classics and some are revered classics because they weren't hits at the time because so many other records were high up in the album charts. And there was, it, it just seemed to peak. I don't know why. I can't explain it, but it just did. And I've got some records here that I would like to show you. Go on. To Go try on. and prove my point. Go on. So here's the first pile. So we've got the first album by The Smiths and yeah. Hatful of Hollow. Yeah. You've got The Works by Queen. You got Purple Rain by Prince, his breakthrough album. Keep Moving by Madness, a forgotten classic, but a classic nonetheless. Alison Moyet's debut, Alf, killer album. This is probably the greatest compilation album ever made, Legend by Bob Marley. Came out in 84, remixes of tracks, but still a classic. This is probably, this probably still sells more records now than many other albums ever made. Controversial, but I still think Paul McCartney's Give My Go Regards to Broad Street is Ooh. a great album. Oh, that's a brave choice. It's a, but I think Even it's he a great would be album. amazed by that. Yeah. Now, Nick Kershaw, he made two great oh, albums in oh, 1984. Yes. Come on. Yeah. Yes. He's a fearless. This is fearless. Yeah. Jean-Michel Jarre made his first album with vocals on in 1984. Howard Jones's debut, Humans Lib, was a banger, and that came out in 84. I consider Power Slave by Iron Maiden one of the greatest heavy metal albums ever made. That came out in 1984. My favourite Spandau Ballet album, Parade, 1984. So can I ask... Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Can I ask how old you were at the time? I was 12. And I think that has something to do with it because I do have this other theory that between the age of about 9 and 13, a lot of your music tastes are set at that point and they stick with you for the rest of your life. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think that's probably true. I think that's like, true. Yeah. What else, you, what else you got there? Go on. This is good. Go on. Right. 1984 gave us the last great album from Slade, The Amazing <laughs> Kamikaze Syndrome. Yeah. It gave us Cafe Blue by the Style Council. It gave yeah. us Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. It gave us Arcadia's So Red the Arcadia, Rose. Arcadia, this is bold stuff. Duran Duran and Herbie Hancock collaborating. Deep Purple's comeback album, Perfect Strangers, the only album they ever made out of the 70s that has tracks on people want to hear live, being Knocking at Your Back Door and Perfect Strangers. Now, this one, to me, the greatest live album ever made, Alchemy by Dire Straits. Right. My God. They're two singles. The Cure released the top. Great record. David Bowie's Tonight, maybe not his finest album, but Loving the Alien, absolutely wonderful seven minutes of music. Blonge, Blamonge's Monge 2, the oh, second good. album. I love Blamonge. My favourite of the early albums, for sure. Who's Afraid of the Art of Noise? Another groundbreaking album purely based on production. But then, here's some other genres. <laughs> <laughs> Tangerine oh. Dreams, Poland. A brilliant album. They released a single from it, Warsaw in the Sun. It was probably their first single in 15 years. Great record. Love it or hate it, Wham's Make It Big is a classic. It sold 10 million copies. Yeah. My favourite solo Roger Waters album, Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. Again, Another this is great risky album. stuff. A sleeve that's no longer uh, allowed out of doubt. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have showed that. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, we can um, deal with it. Now, yeah. my favourite Miles Davis album ever made Ooh, came out in 1984, Decoy, decoy. Ooh, with yeah. John, Sh- John Schofield on guitar and Daryl Jones on bass. <laughs> really brilliant record. <laughs> but then we dump these on the floor and we grab a few more. Oh, my Lord. Right. Wait, I'm going to interrupt this yeah. for a second. This is Matthew North going through 
his his uh, th- the, the the working out for his theory that the Annus Mirabilis of popular music is 1984. Okay, 1984. I simply interrupt because we're going to let Matthew carry on, and we may just fade him out as he's still <laughs> going through. Okay, no, so I've, got, on. I've, I've got a handful of a couple other classics: Marillion's Fugazi, <laughs> the Thompson Twins Hysteria. On a cassette, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. One of my favourite cassettes ever, <laughs> Into the Gap by the Thompson Twins. <laughs> it's My Life by Talk Talk. <laughs> the Unforgettable Fire by U2. The Flat Earth by Thomas Dolby. And last but not least, Rattlesnakes by Lloyd Cole. With a, fresh cr- with a fresh crack on the cover because I trod on it just now. Oh, I, wow. I admire that and I, so I like the diversity. I like the fact you've yeah. got The Art of Noise and Miles Davis. You've also got, you know, Dar Straits in there. <laughs> but I, 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 like, I, like the fa- I like the fact that you're not afraid to kind of go in, in uh, to contravene conventional wisdom. And I think that's a good Yeah, I do too. Oh, of course. Yeah. Far Arcadia. Too many, far, far too many people go, Arcadia, oh, Nick Kershaw, Howard Clash Jones. Or yeah. whatever. You know. I agree with you totally. You haven't done that at all. That's <laughs> not rock critic stuff at all. Uh, no, more, no. more power to you. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. Hey.